Wisdom, the Buddha says, begins with a series of questions. What is skillful? What is unskillful? What is blameworthy? What is blameless? What when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? And what when I do it will lead to my long-term harm and pain? Doing meditation is one of the answers to that question. It's one of the reasons why we're here, because it is, is skillful and blameless and leads to long-term welfare and happiness. And as you do it, you're going to run into parts of the mind that are not interested in long-term welfare and happiness, or interested in a little bit of pleasure right now. In fact, you find this all along the path. The very beginning answers to those questions are start with what the Buddha calls it the Ten Guidelines. Abstaining from killing, abstaining from stealing, abstaining from illicit sex, abstaining from lies, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter, trying to get rid of inordinate greed, ill will, and wrong views. You notice there's a lot of abstaining and getting rid of there. And there'll be parts of the mind that don't want to abstain and don't want to get rid. So it's not simply that we're following rules here. As we follow the rules, we begin to see things in the mind that we might not have seen otherwise. For instance, if you don't take the precept against lying, You don't really notice how many times you exaggerate the truth, or embroider the truth, and embellish the truth, say things that are not quite right. But when you make up your mind, what you're going to say is true. You're going to give a true representation of what you believe is happening, what you saw, what you hear. Then you begin to notice whatever impulses you have to misrepresent the truth even a little bit. And so in doing these skillful actions, you're not just creating good karma, you're also discovering things about the mind. And here again, as you're focusing on the breath, there'll be a lot of wandering around in the mind that you wouldn't have noticed if you hadn't made up your mind you were going to stay right here. Otherwise, you float seamlessly from one thought into another, into another. If you were to draw a map of where your thoughts have been for five minutes on a normal day, you'd see what a tangle they are. But you don't notice it until you've made up your mind you're going to stay in one place. The good thing about noticing these things is because the roots of unskillful behavior are not in things outside. If we do something unskillful, we, there are a lot of people who say, well, I did that because so and so else did this. But the Buddha said, no, it comes from your own greed, aversion, and delusion. And that's what we want to see, because we need to dig up those roots. We counteract them. To counteract greed with being generous, but that just counteracts it. It doesn't dig it up. In counteracting it, you bring it out into the open, and then you've got to see what's its allure. When these things arise, why do you go for them? When they pass away, why do you try to dig them up again? What is it that you like about greed? What is it you like about anger? What is it you like about your delusion? You see these things in other people, and you see how ugly they are, but for some reason you think they're not as ugly in you. Your mind states are not defiled. Your mind states are not ugly like that. When they actually get in the way of something you're trying to do, that's when you begin to realize they really are a problem. And once you admit that they're there, then it's a lot easier to see what their drawbacks are, and then you compare the drawbacks with the allure. And 
this requires a lot of honesty, both in seeing what the actual drawbacks are. We find it so easy to deny that we've done something wrong, or that if people are harmed by our actions, either they don't matter, or it wasn't because of us. So you have to be honest about the drawbacks, and you also have to be honest about the allure. Which part of your mind really likes being greedy? Which part of your mind really likes revenge? Which part of your mind really likes all these unskillful things that come from aversion and greed? Delusion is harder to deal with, because by definition, when you're deluded, you don't know you're deluded. But the best test for that is if you come up with a course of action, the possibility of doing A or B. And if A looks okay, you go ahead and do it. But you've got to watch. What, what is okay about A? First, you have to look at your intention. Do you expect any harm to come from this? If so, you don't do it. If it's past that test, the next test is why you're doing it. Do you see any harm coming up? If you do, you stop. If it passes that test, you continue with the action until it's done, and then you look at the long-term results. If you see if there are any drawbacks to what you did, then you make up your mind, okay, I'm not going to do that again. And you've learned a lesson. Something that looked okay was not. You've chipped away a little bit at your delusion. Because this, these are the areas where delusion is most important. We're deluded about our intentions and deluded about the results of our actions. It's all too easy reading the, the text to see, well, delusion is something about Four Noble Truths and gets bigger and bigger when it's delusion about dependent core rising. It makes it all very abstract. But you have to realize, when the Buddha is talking about the Four Noble Truths and dependent core rising, what is he talking about? He's talking about your intentions, how they give rise to actions and how those actions give rise to results. Now those right <coughs> results give rise to pain. So it's right here where you're going to look at to see those things. The Buddha's analysis just gets very, very precise. It's helpful to see what made you give rise to an intention. You dig down in the causes of dependent arising, you find the Buddha talks about fabrication. He talks about perceptions and feelings. He talks about the way you talk to yourself. He talks even about the way you breathe. So you dig down into your in intentions and you come back to right where you, we are right here, right now, the way you're breathing. So you study your mind as it moves away from the breath. And you've learned, okay, that's how an intention forms. If it all happens at ignorance, it's, it's going to lead to suffering one court, <clears throat> one kind or another. If you do it with knowledge, then it becomes part of the path. So here we are at the breath, right next to the place where intentions get launched. And we have some control over how we breathe, and we have some control over how we pay attention to the breath. We try to develop our skills so we can expand that amount of control. And in doing so, we gain a lot of insight. And it's the insight that helps us let go of the greed, aversion, and delusion. So that our actions will lead to long-term welfare and happiness. So be skillful, then be blameless. So what we're doing is we're breathing right here, paying attention to the breath, being alert, keeping the breath in mind, trying to breathe in a way that's skillful. It gives rise to a sense of ease that we can spread around the body. It's not just for our comfort right here and now. The comfort is part of the reward of concentration. But the other reward is that you're getting to see very clearly the mechanics of the mind that can lead either to long-term harm and suffering or to long-term welfare and happiness. happiness that harms nobody. So we rest both to gain some strength, but then you, once you've got that strength, you don't just sit there. 
you put it to work. And it's also not the case that the insights are going to come after you come out of concentration. While you're doing the concentration, as I said, you run up against a lot of things in the mind you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. So be alert to the fact of what's going on. When the Buddha recommends that you stay with the breath, he's putting you in the right place. So that you can start giving good answers to those questions yourself.